I, have, some years ago, had an encounter with a family that I was counseling, and they wanted to serve God, but they were having a lot of problems. And I said, well, have you ever prayed through your house? <clears throat> because I believe that's very important. If, we're, if, if, if God is the God of our house, we need to sanctify it, set it aside for God. And I'm, and I'm going to get it to it. So I went to their home, and they came from a culture that had a lot of dragons and little gods and, and praying through the house. I said, what's that? Oh, that's a, that's a antiquity that's come down through the generations from the old country. Um, and that's a very intricate family, blah, blah, blah. And I just prayed with them. And I said, you know, I really feel you might want to take that out. Because it was not God glorifying and it was just the opposite. <clears throat> and uh, they didn't and they quit the church and whatever. I had a situation when I was a young pastor where a guy had come back from Vietnam and just could not. He wanted to serve the Lord. He just couldn't do it and went to his house and uh, went in. There's a little Buddha about that tall. I am a little short, little little Buddha. You know, I could probably pose for it, Big Billy. Somebody rubs it. <laughs> and, and went in and he, I, we, here's a guy that New to serving the Lord, he just keeps tripping up. And uh, he walks through the door, but first he stops and rubs Buddha belly. And I said, what's that for? He got luck. I says, that's where you're getting your luck? And I, and, oh, I got it in Vietnam when I was there, and blah, 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 blah. And uh, I said, you know, you might want to get rid of that. You might want to turn your fate, your hope, onto Jesus Christ. He did. And as far as I know, he's still serving the Lord. Very apt and able person. And I, that came to me when we were singing uh, Head of Our House and that kind of stuff because I believe you need to have in your homes things that glorify God. Yes. If you're going to have pictures or anything else, that needs to be glorifying to God. You need to have stuff that's, you need to put stuff away that's not glorifying to God. You need to put away the Buddhas and the other little things. Ah, they're harmless. I'm just not going to go there. It's up to you. People always go, oh, tell us what to do. I'm going to tell you what to do. You can ask God what to do. But I believe everything in my house needs to glorify God, Amen. including what I watch on television. That means my news gets shorter and shorter every time. But I, I just that, I felt that was a word from the Lord for somebody. If you got something, you're having a struggle in a room, struggle in an area, go and, and say, Lord, what's going on here? Why can't I sleep? Why can't I do this? Why, what's going on here? I believe the Holy Spirit will show you. And if you've never anointed your house, I suggest you do that. Declare it unto the Lord. Amen? Um, bridging the chasms. So great a chasm. Bridging the chasm. Timothy tells us that in the latter days, people are going to move away from godliness. The last days, tough times are coming, perilous times. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to the parents, unthankful, unfolding, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self control. They'll be brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, hardy, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people turn away. For this sort of people who creep into the households and take captive gullible women, blah, 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 and done the sense. We're in a time and an age, you go turn to Romans, the first chapter of Romans on the downward spiral of humanity. It talks about all the things that man's doing in the last age. And my goodness, I think we ran by it four or five years ago. When it talks about what man, what's going to happen, I'm just thinking, my goodness, we're at a point now where it's just all around us. Romans, the end of the first chapter of Romans ends with, not only they will embrace evil, embrace what God rejects, God, God calls it an abomination, but they'll vote it into office, if you read the Phillips of the Modern Translation. 
We have to, as Jesus' ministers, we have to bridge the chasm. We have to bridge the gap that divides us from other people, other Christians and the world. We need to be proactive. Jesus talks about where, look, lift up your, lift up your eyes. They're, they're in the well. They're in Samaria. And there's this woman, and, and, and Jesus encounters her at noon. She's not only rejected by the Jewish sect, she's rejected by the Samaritans. She, she has to get her water at noon. Jesus talks to her. Jesus brings life. Jesus doesn't chastise her, doesn't tell her about all the husbands. There. He just says, speaks life to her, living water. And his disciples come back and they go, hey, what's going on, man? Well, I've had my food. Who brought your food? And he says to his disciples, lift up your heads. The harvest is white. We need to recognize that the church, it is, we're in a day and we're in an age that's so depraved that if somebody will just stand up and lead people and just talk to them, just love them to life in Jesus Christ, just stand there and say, Hey, Jesus loves you. I love you. I want to care about you. I'm going to bridge this gap. No, stop it. All you got to do, it's easier than falling off a log to meet a sinner. It is. If we will stop being intimidated. God's not giving us the spirit of intimidation. Man pleasing, fear of man. We don't have to do that. It's time for the church, I believe, in the Holy Spirit to stand up and love people life in Jesus Christ. John 17, of course, you all know John 13 to John 17 through John, it's all the Last Supper. It's all that setting at the Last Supper. And during that, he's telling them what's going to go on. He washes their feet. He does this. He does that. I am praying not only for these disciples, he's talking to the Father in prayer, but also for all of those who believe in me through their message. For I in them, I am in them, and you are in me, May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me, you love me, you love them as much as you love me. It goes on, it says in chapter 15, if the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. If they persecuted me, they're also going to persecute you. And by the way, don't get this persecution complex. Oh, woe is me. I'm Eeyore. I'm going to go eat worms or whatever Eeyore does. I mean, oh, come on. All of you know Eeyore. Sign above my desk. Who saw, did you see it? Who saw it for the first time? Somebody saw it for the first time. And it said, thou shalt not whine. It's not going to do any good. We need to be the most positive people on earth that God's in charge, and it's easier than falling off a log to reach people for Jesus Christ. Somebody's got to stand up. That's not braggadociously. We have a society that hates us. We have a culture that hates us, and it's spinning worse and worse. We even have church that despises us and, and doesn't care for us. But that's okay. That's a sign we're doing something right. Don't, don't, again, again, don't, stop. Stop it. Just be thankful the Holy Spirit is guiding you and getting you where he wants to get you to. Listen to him. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Satan and his demonic workers are attempting to silence believers. Thank you. Of course, we watch the same news thing. Family, a pastor in, I'll say Massachusetts, it was Massachusetts, Center City pastor. They um, take hard to newborn babies that are hard to, they're crack, they're, they're, they're drug dependent when they're born, and then they take them into their home. And they've adopted five children over the years, and his wife, the man and his wife. And they had another, and the reviews, the past reviews on him are just superlative. You can't say enough things, nice things about this man and his family. At least the state couldn't. Until this last drug addicted uh, baby was born, was getting ready to be born, and they called and said, Hey, can you take one more? At least foster. And I go, Sure. But you need to sign these new forms. This is a newborn. Okay, drug addicted newborn. You have to allow them if they're gender fluid. The only thing fluid on a newborn is the two openings.
And I better stop there. <laughs> I, and, and they not only took him, wouldn't let him adopt, and they're, they're begging somebody to pick up, but this family obviously had a ministry and an anointing for the newborn crack addicted babies or whatever drugs. The state said, you're completely off the list now. By the way, you're smiling and going, oh, Oregon does the same. You need to understand that if you're going to foster in the state of Oregon, the C Child Protection Service has a list of rules and things that are insane. They fit right into Timothy. They fit right into Romans. It's time we stand up. Now, I watched this pastor and his lawyer, and they're going back after him. We have to start kicking back. That's okay. That's okay. We're not here to get chewed on by some wolves. We serve the lion. Don't have to defend him. Just let him out. And he's calling for us to stand up and say, hey, if they persecuted me, they're going to also persecute you. And you've kept my word. They'll also, you'll keep it. We need to understand there's a chasm out there, but we need to be the people that bridge it, first in prayer, then in action. But if we're not, let's just say, if you're not registered to vote, you need to be. That's a responsibility and a privilege that we have as believers. How you vote is between you and God. How you can vote some way is beyond me. We'll talk more about that as we get to the fall and we get to scriptures. The world is branding us as intolerant, heartless, or any other derogative label they can use to keep us from speaking up in love or truth. They want the truth shut down. That's what, that's what the Roman 1 talks about. They're just going to silence it. That which was wrong is right. Isaiah does the same thing. In times, they're going to, they're going to call evil good, good evil. I love the end of Romans in the, in the modern translation, and they will vote for it. They'll vote for those policies. But we see it all around us. If the church doesn't pray and get involved, then we are negligent in what God has called us to do. I don't think there's any way around it. I think we have to be praying, and then we have to get involved. God may even... We have people here who are working now at the booths and the polling thing. We need that. I better stop right there. That's not part of the sermon yet. All too often... Believers feel that we're not able to minister to people because of the chasm that divides us, because of the great cultural, ethnic, social, or political things that divide us. That's simply not true. We're going to just look at a few. I, I, I'm sorry, I had like 40 of them, but I thought you don't want to sit here until next week. Um, just went through all of these, and we're going to talk about a few of them this morning. Every area where Jesus, where, where in Jesus' society, Jesus' society was as culturally ethnically, socially divided as ours, and they might have even had worse penalties if you cross the line. Here you'll just get ostracized or called a name. Um, there you could be kicked out of the, the fellowship. You could be whatever. They're perhaps even more so politically, sectarian, religious, social belief system. But somehow we're going to look at it and we're going to see the fact that Jesus is able to bridge that chasm. And I believe we need to be people who can do the same thing. It's just for greater things you will do than I have done when I go to the Father. We need to understand we need to bridge that chasm. There's people out there who need somebody to walk, who, who just in a general... Holy Spirit, if you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit, talk to me after church. You need to be. Because how are you going to be directed by the Holy Spirit if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit? Yeah. So let's just put that right out there. We need to be directed to where, oh, and as we're talking to people, the guy going into the house of the Buddha, I didn't think anything about it until I got right there and I reached down and rubbed its belly. And then I realized, pal, you got an entrance. You're looking someplace else than the Lord Jesus Christ for provision. Psalm says, as our ways please him, he gives us favor with all men, not Buddha. So let's just look at a few. You had Jews versus the Gentiles. That's the world. They couldn't have any contact. 
and just completely ostracized. Were God's chosen? They are. Were pre See, the problem was they thought they were chosen to be chosen to be chosen to be chosen. They were chosen to send out the word, to display God's love, to display his glory, to display his power to the world, not to try to isolate and hang it on to themselves. Even when Gentiles became proselytized, converted Gentiles, they were still considered second class. Even when the Gentiles, Holy Spirit fell on them, they received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and then they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues, and all the other great things that God did through them with Peter and Paul and others, they still held these people to a stricter standard. We all know the understanding of Galatians. The idea of specialized privilege. We, we just need to understand that, that they thought they were special and everybody else, no. Lord said, the whole, read, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, read Acts the 15th chapter. And if you run into somebody that says, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to observe that Jewish holiday, that Jewish holiday, that Jewish holiday, you got to use this. Turn to Acts 15 and say, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit in us. There. Nowhere does it say in the fall when the Feast of Booths that we've got to go outside and chop down little trees and live outside for a week. I'm picking on some, you know, that, but again, <clears throat> the, the Jew and the Gentile, we are grafted in. The promises of God are yea and amen. We do not need to have those extra things done. God's given us. So they had a huge, you couldn't even talk to a Gentile. Holy Spirit's going to work through that. Jesus worked through that. By the way, there were just a few people that uh, Jesus, well, Matthew 8, turn over there. Don't have no, I, I, I had to cut all these down. <clears throat> I didn't cut them down, I put some out. First of all, uh, that comes on another one. He's going down the road. A leper comes up, worships him, Lord, if you're willing, you make me clean. First of all, the leper wasn't supposed to get close to him. Second of all, the leper had to be shouting continuously, leper, unclean, unclean. And everybody's supposed to give him. Well, if it was Dr. Fauci, he'd been six foot, but actually for, uh, um, <clears throat> for the Jews, it was 20. But, you know, hey, what can I say? Maybe he had a mask on, too, or seven or seven that Jesus put his hand on him and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy was cleansed, and Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priests, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. <clears throat> Boom. Huge, huge, huge no-no. Huge no-no. You do not touch lepers. But see, that was the rule. We'll talk about when we get to Pharisees. Uh-uh. Are we willing to touch people that are untouchable, the untouchables? Are we willing to care for people that others don't care about? That's huge. And you've got to find a fine line here because there are people who will use you and use you and abuse you, and you need to know when enough is enough. But as far as this, for healing, for care, pray for them. Pray for it's okay. We're back to uh, can't deal with uh, Jew and Gentile. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion, that's a Roman officer. If we were reading the book of Esther, and I said, what's the guy's hand about hand? The guy that got hung by his own gallows, Haman. When we read through the book of Esther, every time Haman's name comes up, you're supposed to boo and hiss and stomp your feet. But if you were a good Jew, when you, t when you heard a Roman and looked at a Roman, you spat on the ground, not at him, it cost you a lot. And you certainly didn't talk to him. And you didn't do anything for them that wasn't absolutely necessary. And Jesus entered Capernaum, and a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Now I can see the disciples going, whoa, 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 whoa. Back away, Jesus. Do you know that's a Roman? That's a Gentile? Not only a Gentile, that's a Roman Gentile. 
And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worried that you should come under my roof, but my only speak and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does that, this. Then Jesus said, heard it and marveled and said to those who followed around him, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Man, that had to hurt. That flat had to hurt. To an arrogant people who thought they were the cat's meow, that had to hurt. For I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of kingdom, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, "Go your way, as you have believed, so let it be done for you." And his servant was healed at the same hour. So Jesus not only commended this, the Roman, the, Jew, the Gentile, he healed his servant. Where, who are the untouchables? I can think of some untouchables we usually don't deal with very well. I, in one of my classes, um, I was told to go into downtown Portland or go someplace and intermix with a group you would not normally intermix with. So, on Saturday evening, by myself, I got dressed up and went down to a dyke bar. That's a lesbian bar. What an experience. They didn't throw me out. I was kind. I was polite. But I just listened and watched and said hi. Quite an experience. Because a lot of Christians, well, just leave them alone. No, I think we need to move closer to them, not further away from them whether it's that or whether it's transgender, whether it's all of that kind of stuff, rather than reject, we need to move closer so that they know that they're loved. It doesn't mean that we accept what they're doing is right, but it does mean, as Jesus was with the Roman centurion, we move in their direction. Ouch, okay, some of them don't like me anymore. We've got Jew versus Samaritan. Everybody know that? How many say all Harry Potter? Don't admit it. Okay, nobody admit it. Okay, nobody's going to admit it. I didn't hear that horrible thing. The first two or three were good. Then it got out of hand. They call, what did they call the, the mixed blood? Mullet, mull, what was it? Muggle. Okay. How come you didn't put your hands up earlier? <laughs> that was the derogatory term was muggle. They aren't pure. Well, you have, when Rehoboam, Solomon's son, takes over the throne, his, his buddies who are with him saying, hey, you're king. You can do whatever you want. So one of, And they just finished the temple. Solomon had finished the temple. Tons of taxes, tons of money went out. And the older advisors said, hey, back up now. Give the people some breathing space. Back up on the taxes. Back up on this stuff. Give them a chance. They've just finished the temple. They've given willingly and openly, so just back up. His young advisor says, no, 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 no. You're you're the king now, Rehoboam. So you you just put the weight on. They got to do what you say you got to do. And so 10 of the kingdoms said, bye-bye, Rehoboam. And they took 10 kingdoms and became the nation of Israel. That's the northern kingdom. Judah's the southern kingdom. Well, about 80 years after they broke free, they were conquered by Assyria. Assyria did what many countries did in that time. You conquer a nation, you take part of the people away, and you leave a part of them there, and then you take parts of people from other nations and other places you've conquered and bring them in. So that that whatever they found as a nationality, whatever they found as a a national pride, a national whatever, it could be diluted and lost. That way they couldn't have, we are this nation any longer. Well, the Jews, they're muggles. They're not pure. They're intermixed. Now, they kept to the Pentateuch, some of the stuff. 
But there was just an absolute disgust of the Jews towards the Samaritans. Remember that, that you got Samaria here, you got Jerusalem down here, you got the Transjordan Valley. And in order to go up to Galilee, the quickest is a straight line. Do we agree to that? That the quickest point between two points is a straight line? Well, not for a Jew at that time, because you've got to go up the transport and go around, because you don't want to step a foot in Galilee. I mean, step a foot in Samaria. They would go 40 extra miles walking. And yet Jesus says, I must go. I must go through Samaria. Where there he meets the woman, tells her, whole village is saved, by the way. He's recognized the Messiah. He elevates her, elevates the village, tells his disciples, wake up. Wake up. The harvest is, you, you, your selective harvest. I'm telling you, the harvest is white. Same, same thing with, with, uh, with the woman of the well. Same chapter, just right in the middle of it. Wake up. Folks, there are people out there who need Jesus Christ, and we need to talk to them, to spend time with them, just to get to know them and minister them in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Just speak truth. Accepted her where she was. Didn't say he accepted what she was doing, just accepted her where she was. Wasn't afraid to engage, loving, caring conversation. Holy Spirit will tell you where to go. Now, that's just Jews and outside. Let's look at Jews and, and, and uh, the political, Jewish political, social, and religious strife. We got the Pharisees. Now, poor Pharisees, they always get a bad rap. Well, they deserved it. Um, they're the arrogant. They're the ones who, they keep, what's the word? They keep the, the, from the fathers. They keep the word, the, everything from the fathers. Now, they took Ten Commandments. They took the other commandments that were with them, and they added thousands of fence laws. Thousands of them. When you go home today and you set your luncheon table, make sure that you don't miss one of the 360 dinner table laws. It's a trip to go to um, King David Hotel, which is in, inside Jerusalem, down in Jerusalem, because most of those laws, if you have a, a, a section for their eating, you can go and they, they, it's all set how it's supposed to be. I couldn't think of that. Can't, I couldn't do it. But I did go over there and have dinner. It was pretty good. But do not mix those two things or you will get in trouble. So they had, you know what a fence law is, right? Okay, um, here we go. Fence law. You shall not commit adultery. Okay, okay. Pretty plain and clear. Uh-uh, uh-uh. We've got to add some fence laws. First of all, since we don't want to commit that over there, let's put some fences so you can't get there. First of all, make all the ladies in gunny sacks. That diminishes some stuff. But then they got pretty good looking eyes, so you've got to do something there. Oh, if you're coming down the street, here's a law, here's a fence law. If you're walking down the street and you see a woman coming from the other direction, she must lower her eyes and you must cross the street. More, and every situation in life where God gave us a command, they would make numerous fence laws so that we never... You know, the thing is, they're not, I'm not saying those are horrible things. I'm saying they don't want to break this one over here. So they have all these fences so you never get there. A lot of people went around the fences. We won't talk about that. Um, Romans were loved, to, the Pharisees loved to argue. They were known for negotiating with the Romans. Um, they had their own version of what it meant to serve God. They had the, their version of the Pentateuch uh, and the translations from their fathers. That's the phrase I was looking for. They were critical of Jesus. They, they were the most critical of Jesus because he kept poking them. The guy that was healed on Sunday. How dare you? He's a cripple all his life. You healed him on a Sunday. You should have kicked him two or three times because he deserves that. Now, you could have finished him on Sunday and healed him, not, not on Saturday. They, they were incensed that Jesus would... Heal him on a Sunday. He broke their law. His disciples walk in the field, grab the wheat, crush it in there, and you eat it. Oh, kick him out of church. It's horrible. 
All the things that Jesus touched in the leper. All these kind of things that broke their law. I think anytime there's uh, there are church traditions that keep people from Jesus, we need to take real close at them. That's why you'll hear me or Pastor Phil or Carl, whoever is doing it, if we have communion here, table, I will, you do not have to be, I've been in churches where if you weren't a member of that church in good standing, could never receive communion. I've had churches where if uh, Jesus Christ is not your personal Lord and Savior and follow him the best of your ability today, you're not to receive communion. I mean, just all these rules. Look, you want to receive communion, come on. I'm not going to stop anything from getting you closer to God or God closer to you. That's up to you and me. It's not me. I'm not, I'm not the guy with the hammer that does that. It's my job to make sure the door is open. It's my job to care that you come to Jesus. One of the greatest examples is Zacharias. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He knows what waits when he gets there. He knows what's going on. He goes through, and four foot two, nothing Zacharias, the tax collector, working from the Romans and taking the money from the Jews. I mean, we're talking about a little slimy dude. And Luke, he runs down the street, he climbs into a tree. And by the way, you know he had to be short because the average person in that time was five foot three. And the Bible says he was extremely short. So I don't know what that puts him at. But climbs up, Jesus comes in. Jesus is listening to Father. He's listening all the time. Stops. Zacchaeus, come on down. Make haste. Hurry up. I want to go to your house and have lunch. Come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste, and he came down, and he received him joyfully. But when they, that's the Pharisees, they all complained. He has gone to be a guest of a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood up and said with a man, and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I will restore it fourfold. Jesus turns and says, Salvation has come to the house this day. Jesus spoke to one of the untouchables. Not only that, he said, I'm going to go to the house and have lunch. And by the way, we've talked about this before. You didn't go to somebody's house to eat. You didn't have Taco Bell on the corner. You didn't have a refrigerator. When somebody came to somebody's house to eat, that was huge. Zacchaeus couldn't run down to the you know, local shop and get a pulled pork sandwich. Okay, nobody picked up on it. <laughs> the reality is they had their, their inter-struggles. We have got to let that kind of stuff. Pharisees were a prime example of it. This is what you need to do. Pharisees were always complaining. And I think we need to understand we don't need to be afraid of religious zealots. Be careful. Be careful for those who tell you what you can and can't do in the name of Jesus. I'm not saying you can do anything that's against the Word of God, but I'm saying there's a lot of things in, we need to do. We need to minister. Don't get bogged down in arguments. It was always the Pharisees. Oh, should we pay taxes or not? Should we do this? Should we do that? Always trying to trick him. Don't get caught down in arguments. Just love Jesus. Give truth. Give it in love. Give it clearly. Love, acceptance, forgiveness, and respect. Four things you'll get when you come here. Amen? Now you got the Sadducees, and uh, actually the Sadducees are uh, different translations of Herodians. They followed the, the, the family of Herod. That's how they got their power. They, they came during the time of the Maccabees. Um, they were always in opposition to the Pharisees because the Pharisees had all these rules, do's and don'ts, and they disagreed, and they didn't pull in. They, they didn't believe anything beyond their original Pentateuch, and so they were going, hey, 
There's no angels, there's no resurrection, there's no spirits, and they just had tons of stuff they were in disagreement with. But they were a small group, they were a powerful group, because they had the, the ear. Herod the Great, Herod the, uh, Articulus, all the other Herods that run down there as Roman put in positions. And so they arose during the Maccabean period, um, they, they aligned with the family of Herod. That's where they got their power base. Um, they persecuted Jesus. But also, well, here's an interesting thing. After the resurrection, it was the Sadducees more than the Pharisees that persecuted the early church. But they had their own way of thinking about things. By the way, they didn't like Jesus for a number of reasons. One of them was twice... Jesus cost him a bump of money. Jesus, God said, when you build this temple, I want you to put a court out here. It's called the court of Gentiles. It's where those that are seeking me, who are gentle, can come and worship and pray. It's a place of prayer. Well, Jesus goes up on in there. It doesn't matter what you brought. You brought a spotless lamb. Ah, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. But I got one right here and I'll sell you. And that was the whole thing. That was all, that's why Jesus took the whip. Joe turned over, not once, but twice. Turned over their tables and drove them all out. You turned this house to be a house of prayer into a den of thieves. They lost some good coinage. They didn't like him for that. And he taught them, and he said to them, it is, not, is it not written, my house shall be a called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. I, don't, I think it's right that we don't, I think it's right we stand up to traditions that glorify man rather than God. Okay, I've got, this is, I've told the story before. I was seventh grade. Um, my, one of my older brothers, um, off the chart men's society, just off the chart genius. Anyway, he, he, uh, Parents are praying for him, and he got into the wild side, flower child wild side, um, weather underground, and some other stuff. He finally showed up at home. I think I was 7th or 8th grade. Showed up. Couldn't believe it. His hair down about his waist, thin as a rail, using whatever drugs he was using, and came to the house. Mom and Dad, I could hear Mom and Dad praying week after week after week after week for him. And uh, showed up, and man, I was real glad to see him because he was really cool. And anyway, to, you know, he shaved. I didn't shave. He showered. You know, <laughs> he was thin enough he could wear some of my clothes. And uh, got dressed and came to church. I can tell you exactly. I showed it to Patty this year. We went to the church that my mom played the organ at, and uh, went in. I won't say the lady's name anymore. She walked up behind him. He had his, 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 his ponytail was his, what do you call it when it's down to your waist and it's in a, what's it then? It was, anyway. And he had a nice shirt, one of mine on, and nice slacks, big beard. Lady walked up behind him and said, shouldn't let these hippies in here until they cut their hair and shave their beards. She taught Sunday school. I was a favorite of hers. Anyway, um, he turned around and left. Broke my parents' heart. Absolutely broke their heart. I've had people leave this church. You know why? We have drums. Don't tell anybody we got drums. Remember when guitars first came into church? Oh, it's falling down. Everything's going down. Can't have that. Same attitude. That's that same attitude. We got this standard, and anybody who wants to serve Jesus has got to start out up here. We need to love them to life to where they're at. Let Jesus change them. It doesn't mean we don't have standards. It doesn't mean we don't care. What it means is I'm not going to put a point between you and Jesus. We should not be that way. 
Don't be afraid to stand up against situations where the church, which rules and regulations, which are not biblical, which keep sinners from entering. Watch your own hearts and judgments against others. Luke 6, 31. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not perceive the plank in your own? Okay, so we've gone through Pharisees, Sadducees. We've gone through Samaritans and Gentiles. Uh, let's finish up. No, we got the Seans. Who are the Seans? Ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Okay, the Seans. By the way, you think this, these people can't talk to each other. All these people live in this little close thing, and they don't like each other. You think Jesus had a talk mind ministry? No, he just went to it. We have got to stop the world from telling us who we can minister to and who we can't minister to. We've got to love people's life in Jesus Christ. We've got to be bold enough to go. Or when they come, just start talking. Don't reject them. Amen. My goodness, there are some really good shades of purple out there in hair. When, when I first saw that kind of stuff, I would go, you're kidding me. Now I think, oh, that's pretty nice. And finally we had somebody who was doing it all the time. Man, it's really, really nice. I probably complimented them four or five times years ago. And then they quit doing it. And I thought, were they doing it just to see what I'd do? I think it, we, we need to really be a people who said that's enough. We've got the Aseans, Dead Sea Scrolls. No political involvement. You've got a bunch of people in the church say we can't do that and where we should be. I believe we should be in politics. They rejected temple worship. They were sacerdotists. They gave up. You had to give up your money, your family, and everything. It goes to them. You had to reject your family. You had to get away from the world. Do we have that kind of stuff? All the time. Don't you go there. Don't you go there. Don't you go there. You've got a place called The Ranch in Haynes, Alaska. And... I think they're dying off by now. They started in the early 70s. But they've withdrawn from the world because Jesus is coming back for a bride without spot or blemish. And you keep getting these hippies saved. you got so much cleanup to do. Jesus will never be able to come back. So they isolate themselves and say, okay, now you've got to do this, this. No! But that, this is stuff. By the way, Jesus had a lot of contact with the Essenes. So did the early church. And, and just never bothered Jesus, went right at it. Look at Paul writes this you become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation among whom you shall shine, lights of the world. Matthew, Jesus said, Let your light shine before men, they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The Bible and the parables says, Go in the highways and the byways and tell the com compelled them to come. Just talk to them. Just get in there among them. Do not pull yourself back. And that, by the way, now I'm going to let me step on some stones. Everybody can move your toes a little bit so I can get right on them. Talk to your neighbors. Don't isolate yourself from your neighbors. Don't isolate yourself. Say hi. Begin with there. You know. Take him a plate of oatmeal cookies. Those are good cookies last week, though. Start with that. Begin to don't isolate. We can't do that. Well, I can't go with them because. No, go with them. People ask me, well, how come you have the, you know, 15 years or more ago, well, probably 17 years ago now, we had... We started with Cub Scouts. Then it became scouting. And quite honestly, they cost us the church quite a bit. And there's a lot. And I've had people, well, why don't we just get rid of them? Because there has to be a point we can stay in contact with them, those parents. By the way, hey, 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 sermon announcement. They're not really a sermon announcement. We need a representative from this church to come on Tuesday nights at least once a month to sit and be our church representative for the Scouts. When we had Dan Markinson here, he never missed. His kids were both Eagle Scouts, and so they never caused us any problem at all. 
but we need a representative from our church. So if you've been involved in the scouting program at all, come and, and by the way, I'll throw in Girl Scouts too. And I'm going to, who had Thin Mints? Girl Scouts, I've got to sue that company. I've eaten so many of those things and didn't work. Yeah. Well, Girl Scouts aren't going to give up Girl Scouts. My goodness, that makes way too much money. But in all seriousness, we do need, if somebody feels the Lord call you to be a representative, once a month, at least, on Tuesday night to their PAC meetings. Get involved, okay? Don't be in a sin. Watch out for isolated Christianity. Jesus says, get in there. Get in there. Get in politics. Get involved in politics. Last one, zealots. Simon the zealot. Now, Jewish party of revolt, according to the historian Josephus, they were a faction which inspired the revolt, which led to the 70 AD destruction of the temple. Simon the zealot is in Luke 6 and a couple other places. Don't reject excitable people. I'm sure Simon, after he spent time with Jesus, still didn't want to burn down the Romans. He might have changed. A lot of times we get people who are so excitable, we want to calm them down. Amen? I don't know how old you are, but do you remember how excited you were for Jesus when you first got saved? Bing, 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 bing. I mean, I showed up at church. Lights are on at church. What do we? It's the lady Bible study. Go home. I, I showed up all the time. Told, you know, but again, bless Pastor Barney. I must have driven him nuts. What you doing? What you doing? What can I do? And uh, work nights. Went home, slept. Got up, went to church. What are you doing? Just praise God. Do not disparage, disparage, be nice to excitable people, discourage, there we go, thank you. Just give them to somebody else who's got a lot of energy. (laughs) But love them anyway, I I just, uh, and there's one other, I, I didn't write him down, in fact, I deleted his name. He's the only disciple that didn't come from Galilee, Judas Iscariot. And if you, you have some writings, they're going to tell you he belonged to the sect that was a political assassin. And I won't go into all of that. I de- deliberately didn't get into it. But we need to... Look who Jesus embraced. He knew Judas was a thief the whole time. But he kept him on. He knew when he picked up Simon, the zealot, what his political thing was. He knew Sons of Thunder, loud, crude, rude fishermen. But he still chose them, and he chose you and I. We need not to reject people who God puts in our lives. We need to love them to life in Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that we have to say what they did is right or what they're doing is right. We we just got to keep that connection, keep that bridge between the chasm. We need to learn to be comfortable in going to other places where some believers might think we not might not, not want to be. I told you I went down to a bar in downtown Portland, had to get an address from somebody. And I thought, man, I'll tell you, you want it for me? Help me pray for him a whole lot more. Help me pray for them a whole lot more. When I saw the hopelessness, the sadness they were in, didn't mean I'm any better. All it means is I got a new way to pray. Been to so many of those things. We all know about the junior high gay pride thing and all that kind of stuff. But God's calling us to mix it up in the world. Salt and light. Don't let all the division in society that's trying to silence us, silence us anymore. Amen?
I'm going to just, Lord, help us do that. I, my whole thing is when I, when I saw there is a newborn baby in Massachusetts that's drug addicted. And one of the best per families that experienced the say, state says unless you agree to this gender fluid blah 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 we're not and not only did you not sign that we kicked you off for everything else too some of us would be thinking what's wrong with those people demonic switch camera demonic that's all it is we're looking at a lot of demon working in politics and government right now. And we need to pray against it and stand up to it and get involved. Anyway, I want to encourage you. I want to, this whole sermon, all it's about, Jesus had more society, cultural chasms in his life, but he got over every one of them. None of them stopped him. We need to become people who do not let these things that the society want to keep from people who love. We want to love them to life in Jesus Christ. Amen? I'm serious about the Lord. I'm serious about what God's called us to do. And Father, I pray over each person here, Lord, that every area of their life would be converted to you in every way. Lord, I, I believe you had a strong word for some this morning that their homes need to be cleaned up. Lord, I believe you have a strong word for us that we need to become a people who recognize there are people all around us every day who are crying out, but others aren't touching them. They're not reaching to them. Lord, give us eyes to see, strength to reach in Jesus' name. Show us, Lord. Lord, we think of our neighbors. Maybe they're close and maybe they're far away. We pray. Lord, for opportunities to reach them in Jesus' name. We pray for our co-workers, Lord. We pray for those, Lord, the, the, the groups of people that bother us. Change us, Lord, so we can love them to life in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name.